event of Paris visit to Beirut was hugely significant, not just uh, insofar as the AB community and the Nijmi Club were concerned, but also insofar as Lebanese identity and Jews' local identity more specifically were promoted through Paris visit. And um, he had declined considerably as a football player uh, during the time of his visit in 1975, um, but he was still really the global face of his sport and definitely its most recognized personality. And um, of course, his, uh, his actual visit on April 4, 1975, that was the day of his arrival, came during a brief hiatus in his playing career. Uh, after he had supposedly retired from playing with his boyhood club in Brazil, Santos, and just before he signed with the New York Cosmos in, 19, in June 1975. And here, of course, is um, a picture of Pele with the New York Cosmos with that uh, uh, famed jersey with uh, Franz Beckenbauer, the German star, standing uh, you know, three players behind him. He was my first appearance. But that's neither here nor there. Now, the story of uh, Bellis' visit and his Beirut experience is worth retelling on its own merit, particularly as it came during a time of considerable great social and political unrest. From his press conference at the Holiday at the End Hotel, uh, which is pictured here at the moment, and which only a few short months later will become the scene of one of the war's fiercest battles and is forever etched in the minds of the Lebanese as a symbol of both what was and what might have been to his training session for young players at the American University of Beirut campus and his nights out at famous clubs while supposedly being chased by mysterious lovers. But as we say, in the city paints a vivid image of Beirut's pre-war cultural landscape. It also tells the tale of a city near the peak of its cultural efflorescence, but also so desperately near the abyss. I will first briefly discuss some aspects of Pele's itinerary in Peru, before moving on to describe the circumstances behind his visit. Now, upon his arrival at the Holiday Inn Hotel, where he was to stay for three nights, Pele held a press conference alongside Omar ben Lur, the president of Mission Club, and Anis Asaf, the president of Brasil's local franchise and bottling company, SMLC. And Anis Asaf also happened to be Jews himself, which is a pertinent fact that I, I will refer to later. The press conference ended with uh, being presented with traditional Lebanese attire by public figure and cultural promoter Margot Dayan. You see him here. Uh, in an Amar, an Amar front page photograph with Marco Dayan wearing his Pepsi blazer. That's for the fact, of course, with the Lubada, which is a traditional, of course, northern Lebanese felt hat. And uh, Marco Dayan, as a note, uh, for anyone who might not know, also happened to be the mother of the future president and Ishmael's wife, uh, Joyce Dayan, or Joyce Ishmael. Uh, and uh, in the previous picture here, you see uh, the president of uh, 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 the president of the Indian Club, Omar Nandur. Uh, to his right is the club secretary, Anish Hamdan. And then Pele, and uh, to the far right is uh, an Indian player, I, think, I believe, Ibrahim al So, uh, um, <coughs> Now on Sunday, or rather before that, now the Lebanon's best known newspaper, and Nahar, also published their first ad promoting the match on its front page that same day, i.e. Uh, April, April 4th. And uh, it published details of its sales centers, and it marketed the match, as you see here, as Mubarak Pele, simply the Pele match. And uh, one reporter from an spoke of the city's interest in the two days leading up to the Bele match as bordering on hysteria in the streets of the city. Now on Sunday, April 6, precisely one week before the Civil War, Bele was to play in a friendly for Nishmi versus a collection of French amateur players. Nishmi FC president, 
on my Jandu, that all the motorcade mot- 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 fit for a king to escort Bella to the city. And of course, it was fit for a king because that was one of Bella's many nicknames, as you see here on his, uh, on his jersey, King Bella. The afternoon procession, the afternoon motorcade, was led by a number of Harley Davidson motorcycles, and the president accompanied Bella in one of three large cabinets. Where the two shared a lighthearted moment in which Zandur issued a warning of sorts, where he said, and I quote, that this name, we have a system in which we deduct from players' wages if their performance is not up to par. And Bele laughed responded, duly noted. Now, now, after the match, of course, Monday's papers spoke about the match, and they were clearly confused by the magnitude of the, of the event that had taken place this afternoon, but also clearly underwhelmed by his individual exploits and overall performance during the match, which Disney actually happened to win 2-0 only after Bele had been substituted. Bele would do that to influence the match's outcome, instead of being merely, and I quote, put on a show with his fame, tricks, and flips, rather than exert any real effort toward helping the scheme defeat the French amateur squad during the one half in which he played, as everyone who covered the match at the time agreed. One of Anahar's front page headlines on April 7, 1975, one day after the match, read, and I quote, Bele plays exhibition football and Nishmi needs to finish to keep it. The implicit but not indirect suggestion being that Bele had merely displayed his unmatched repertoire of individual skill but not contributed to the victory in any tangible way. And if you know anything about the Lebanese, they like to take all the credit from both. And, uh, so, can we see of course. Um, the same suggestion was articulated more, more bluntly in a high sports session on the same issue, which explained in its own headline, that it plays through this exhibition football in the first half, then initially plays the second half without him, and scores twice. But it seemed lack of seriousness was particularly curious as he had answered the question as to how he would approach the match in the following manner during the previous evening's press conference, underscoring his tension for using the third person in reference to himself. He, he, he said, and I quote, when Dele plays football, he always plays serious. After fulfilling his duty of playing the first half, Dele joined the Lebanon's Prime Minister, Rashid Slaughter as well as the Brazilian and French ambassadors and thousands of Lebanese in the stands as a mere spectator. On his last day in Beirut, Monday, April 7, AUP's varsity and freshman soccer squads, in addition to players from two high school teams, were in attendance at the university's soccer pitch, the Green Field, of course, as we all know, as well they gave 44 players a two-hour session in which he offered detailed instructions on conditioning, as well as giving the advice <coughs> with some demonstration on goalkeeping, ball control, trapping, and heading skills. And uh, here you see, of course, Bele with, uh, on the green field with a clear view above of the old college hall. The business of representing Pepsi as he did during the strip, of course, as someone who had an endorsement deal with Pepsi, partly prevented the Brazilian star from enjoying <coughs> other aspects of his low-crossing experience and exploring countries which he otherwise may not have been familiar. Uh, his time spent in Beirut, the Middle Eastern city, which at the time was at the peak of its cultural efflorescence, and that few would have expected to be reduced to a violent background only days later, was no exception. And uh, here, of course, you know, you see one demonstration of that as Lele was actually spending his first evening, uh, his first saga, as it were, in Lebanon in the famed uh, nightclub, Le Roi, at the Boivage Hotel, one of the most luxurious hotels of the Ain de Bresse area. And uh, here is, um, Bele actually signing a soccer ball and presenting it to the AUB athletic department. And uh, as far as I know, this ball that Bele signed and gave to the AUB has now been lost. So, and, and that's a 
investigation was that I, I suppose it's, uh, it's another casualty of civil war. Now, on that same evening when he visited the UD, well, it would have was scared like to stumble for another uh, endorsement trip uh, related to his taxi work, and he did the country farewell. So now for uh, explaining the connections uh, and why that I actually made the trip to Lebanon in the first place. Now, of course, the first part of this connection, the first part of the explanation relates to his taxi business. And that is that connection during the 1970s can, of course, be explained within the broader context of the company's vigorous and increasingly <laughs> global marketing campaign as part of what would later be referred to as the Cola Wars or Soda Wars between Pepsi and longtime rival Coca Cola. And of course, uh, this Brazilian superstar uh, loved three things above all as he thinks he won Swift, he loved football and World Christmas, and I quote, speaking about himself in the third person. The, the soap company, Pepsi, had been trying to recruit Pele as a globe traveling soccer coach since 1971, hoping to incorporate training programs for aspiring young players into his busy schedule as a way to market their product. Pele ultimately signed, signed a one year contract with Pepsi in 1973. <coughs> Before extending that contract over a period of another five years following him, having immensely enjoyed his training work around the world and no doubt the lucrative money, lucrative contract, accompanied by his personal coach and confidant, the Brazilian coach Julio Mazzei. His second five year contract was worth $1 million, a large increase over his initial one year, $150,000 agreement with Pepsi. Pepsi named the Sully Project the International Youth Football Program. And before too long, Sully had traveled to a total of 64 countries over a six year period, imparting his knowledge of the game to aspiring young footballers around the globe, in clinics and seminars alongside Pepsi. And during that time, of course, he would meet several uh, well connected and influential uh, public figures. Of just can be distant for seeing here, a certain 1975. And uh, Richard Nixon, during the years of, uh, during the months of Waterloo, of course, uh, or Richard Nixon, of course, was a very close friend of the Pepsico chief executive officer or chief operating officer, the COO, Donald Kendall, who was, uh, who headed one of the committees for, for uh, Nixon's committee to be like the president, unfortunately known as Peep. Uh, um, and so, after that, I came out of retirement, signed with the New York Cosmos in 1975, just months after his Beirut visit, Pepsi, of course, also reaped the benefits. And uh, this was doubtless a very clever strategy in the inter American Cola Wars, in which Coca Cola had the upper hand almost uninterruptedly from the very beginning. Later, Pepsi even created an award worth, worth $10,000 in the Brazilian's name and presented annually to the North American Soccer League's West American and North Canadian players. <laughs> now, as, moving, going back to the Beirut, because at the April 4th press conference at the Holiday Inn in Beirut, uh, the president of Michigan, Omar Tandur, revealed that he had received the request to have Pele visit neighboring Syria on the same trip, but apologetically indicated that the host company, i.e. Pepsi, had declined while promising to grant this request at a later date. It is worth noting that the Pepsi franchise had not yet entered Syria and would not do so for another four decades or less. And as it happens, Pele never did visit Syria as reportedly promised. As I was to play as the Michigan Club's goalkeeper for a portion of the first half, Pepsi also offered to uh, also pledged to offer a year's worth of free beverages to any player from the opposing team who managed to score with a Brazilian between the sticks. As it happens, the French hit the score or even seriously threatened the Michigan goal during the entire 90 minutes. It is of course noteworthy as 
Mexico and its uh, the subsidiary, as we now know, the lot and the ensuing event was a massive success. Mr. Gandur recalls that the total revenue gained from the event was in the region of $135,000, which in today's money would be uh, around $600,000. Of which the bulk was to go to the committee for honoring Prince Asadine, headed by the Ashram, while the rest would cover costs incurred by the NFC and the Pepsi Company in Lebanon, both of whom had financed the entire operation. When asked by the missionary and requested the share of the winnings, Mr. Gandur stated that Vishnu's gain was purely immortal, not material. <coughs> the club's main purpose behind helping organize the proceedings was to further propel Vishnu FC to international notoriety, he insisted. And of course, I will note, uh, sort of off topic, that this was a something of golden age for Lebanese soccer, for Lebanese football at the time, and for the Vishnu club in particular, where they had gone head to head with several international clubs, including uh, Dinamo Kiev uh, and uh, Bayern Munich, and lost only Arab in those matches. Now, after the match uh, between Nishmi, in which he participated, and the, uh, and the French amateur football inside, Dale was actually given a statuette of Prince Akhtin as a participation trophy of sorts, which he raised a lot as the crowd cheered. Sadly, I do not have an image of this, uh, but it is uh, spoken of in Dahish Hamdan's book on the history of Nishma. Dahish Hamdan, I remind you, was the uh, club secretary and right-hand man of Omar Khandur. The actual statue of Khadrin, seen here, would go on to be erected in Martin in the summer of that same year, 1975, during the early months of the Civil War. In the courtyard, from the courtyard of the town's municipality building, the statue went on to take an interesting life of its own. Only eight years after the beginning of the Civil War, in an incident almost dripping with irony, Jews, militiamen, loyal to the dominant Shumla family, destroyed the Tachadine statue, or at least no one ever confirmed who actually built up, but they, of course, um, controlled the whole area, so it is usually presumed. That they did so. In a chapter entitled The War Over Lebanese History from his most famous work, The House of Many Mansions, the preeminent historian of Lebanon, Kamal Salidi, attempted to make sense of this most curious episode in which a Jews force had demolished the representation of perhaps the single greatest icon of Jews' political history, at least under the Ottomans. As Salidi indicated, this occurred during the particularly violent phase of the Civil War, now referred to as the War of the Mountains, with the militias that were predominantly Christian and their Jews' enemies. The Jews ultimately prevailed, of course, and in the process forced the overwhelming majority of Christians out of the Shuf area of which Mahlini was part. So he explained that the seeming Jews' rejection of one of their most legendary historical figures was not, in fact, rejection at all, but rather a refusal to acknowledge the Christian version of Lebanese history in which Hazardin had played a central role. This was evidenced by the fact that the Jumblat family itself kept the portrait of the prince in their palace in Mustara, not far from Hazardin. But Hazardin's person and career, in Salimi's words, and I quote, had been unduly glorified by Christian historians serve Christian political purposes, unquote. Salibi went on to argue that, in the Jews view, the statue in Martin, quote, represented the Khadim in his Christian apotheosis, and it had been set up in his native town by the Christian Lebanese ruling establishment to stand as a false witness to what this same establishment had made of the history of Lebanon. Salibi, was actually mistaken in his belief that the Maronite Christian establishment was directly responsible for the erection of the statue. But in the more general sense of interpreting the incident, he is almost certainly correct. Although it may be true that the Maronite political establishment did not itself directly sponsor the erection of the statue, as we have seen, there is no doubt that the same establishment 
propagate the idea of Khadi as a quintessentially Lebanese national hero and a figure representing the unity of the nation, almost entirely divorced from any Jews as a Moreover, even when that very Jews as specificity seemed to have been invoked by the mere fact that the statue was to be erected in fact of the Jews' hometown of Hakim, and that those presiding over the endeavor for the committee for honoring Khadim were themselves mostly Jews. This establishment, this manner of establishment, embraced this effort and attempted to turn it into one of more widely national efforts. And by national, I mean matter in some sense. How else can Marco Diane's appearance at Pele's press conference and her, and her adorning of the Brazilian with the Northern Lebanese, i.e. Maronite, to Bella, which Bella also were aware with other traditional garments a day later, be explained. Diane, it's worth noting, as I said before, was not only the foremost promoter of Maronite Lebanese cultural heritage at the time, but also the mother in law, Amina Shaim, who in 1982 succeeded his assassinated brother Bashir as president of, president of Lebanon, and more generally, was part of a family that represented arguably the most powerful embodiment of the Maronite Christian political order. Just as the Maronite establishment had appropriated and in many ways created the unifying national myth of Akhadin, it appeared they had also endeavored to turn what was initially a specific Jews project to honor that community's greatest historical figure into an unmistakably unifying national commemoration of Akhadin. And my good friend, Mokran Baba, continues this version of the story, or confirms this version of the story in his doctoral dissertation, where he indicates that Kamal Shumbhat, a Jewish leader at the time when he fled, actually refrained from attending the inauguration of this set you see here before us to remind the establishment, the largely modern establishment, of the inequalities within the Lebanese confessional system. In the dissertation, in fact, Kamal Shumbhat is quoted as saying, and I quote, there is a significant difference between the Lebanon of today and the authentic historic Lebanon. The Lebanon today does not represent the historic heritage or national unity which Shastra Dean embodied and be the authentic Lebanese, the important of the national system, unquote. Oddly enough, it was only long after the end of the war, some 31 years after the initial demolition, that a new statue of Shastra Dean was erected at precisely the same location in October 2014. The passage of time and further trials and tribulations in the country have in all likelihood not only merely erased any recollection of the circumstances behind the erection of the old statue from the Lebanese collective memory, but perhaps even reduced the memory of the statue itself to near oblivion. Although it is certain that many Lebanese, particularly of older generations, you call a time when Bede visited Beirut and played for the city's greatest club during its undisputed golden age. It is no doubt equally true that the original motivations behind the visit are all but forgotten by most. Indeed, when asked 40 years later, the, late, the nature of Bede's mission seemed to have escaped the memory <coughs> of both the former national player whom I interviewed, who was one of the Brazilian teammates of the match, and even more surprisingly, club secretary, or former club secretary, Dahish Hamdan himself, who of course wrote a book on the history of the club. Perhaps more understandably, given his numerous travels during the story career, but I also failed to note the genuine reasons behind his daily visit in a televised interview many years later, describing his trip as a mission of peace and goodwill to a people in crisis. More broadly, the story is, an, is as ideal an example of soccer's fiery party chain influence on matters commercial, cultural, and even historical as one is ever likely to come across. What remains unique, however, about this visit to Beirut is that motivations of a purely local nature, specifically Lebanese and Jews related, were the definitive driving force behind an event that had its forefront at two of the world's largest global brands 
their respective fields, let's see, and uh, thank you.